Okay, well, first of all, to make a distinction between strategy and tactics in um, Japanese strategy is generally translated as senryaku um, and tactics are more saksen. So in making that distinction, we can think of strategy as the, uh, the big plan, the game plan, the whole battle plan, um, and then tactics are the smaller scale, more micro kind of things you do. Well, it's often referred to in, in design terms, for example, in regulatory terms and as an intervention, something that you actually do in a situation, typically to try and change people's behavior or as part of uh, a whole suite or a, we often say a toolbox of tactical moves, techniques, in order to try and realize a grand strategy. You know, in um, military terms, for example, uh, so for example, in World War II, we saw that uh, the United States decided to direct most of its military efforts towards um, defeating Nazi Germany and uh, the Pacific uh, battlefront, um, in relation to Japan, of course, uh, was a short term lesser priority. So a whole range of tactics um, arose from that. The allocation of resources, um, what equipment was manufactured. Um, so, so many micro decisions came about because of a broad strategy. So we understand this. Um, and of course, in a military sense, tactics come right down to very micro level field maneuvers, um, whereas strategy is the, the overall game plan. So let's look here. Uh, first of all, what's this picture? Uh, the opening picture, warning anti-climb paint applied. I've never seen this in Japan. Uh, this is in Glasgow. Uh, it's right outside a sports bar. Um, now I had a uh, Scottish grandmother from Glasgow. So I actually grew up being able to understand the Glaswegian accent, um, uh, unlike most people uh, who uh, not, uh, certainly not British, and uh, I think many many English struggled to uh, to make sense of a Glaswegian accent. Um, but uh, Glasgow is a very distinctive culture. Um, uh, I could go on about that for for an hour. Uh, let's just say the uh, the guys in particular they like a drink and they like to get up to mischief. They like a lot of fun. So a combination of Friday night alcohol. Um, bunch of Glaswegian guys, uh, sports bar and a wall add ups, adds up to a lot of fun challenges. Okay. So you're going to have a lot of guys who've had more than a few drinks, um, trying to climb up the wall, run up and down the wall, as you can see, particularly it's on this big slope. Uh, that runs up. That's a whole lot of fun. And I'm sure lots of people fell off and they hit their head and the emergency uh, um, section of the, uh, the closest hospital spends a lot of time triaging people. So of course the tactic was to put up uh, these signs um, and to say anti-climb paint has been applied. So they've, they've put some paint on the, uh, the top of the wall there and the side of the wall there to stop people climbing on it um, and then put people and put signs up one of the reasons they would put the signs up, of course, is if you put the anti-climb, the, uh, the slippery paint on it, and then people fell off, then actually the government could get sued uh, for having increased the danger of climbing on the wall when you're drunk. But of course, what can you see? Uh, there are lots of muddy footprints all over this. So it's one of those tactics which seems kind of smart and unless you understand the target demographic, that if you tell young Glaswegian guys who are kind of drunk, we have put anti-climb paint applied to, we have put it to this wall, you're thinking, therefore, they wouldn't climb it. They're thinking, oh, a challenge. You've upped the game. So suddenly, this is leveled up. So what is it absolutely guaranteed to do? That more people will actually climb the wall. Many of the things that we attempted to do in the short term are uh, are often counterproductive because people simply read the implications for themselves in a different way that we had imagined. So the first thing you need to do before you have any intervention, whether it's a design intervention, a regulatory intervention, a communications intervention, is you really have to understand the psychology, the values of the people involved in that behavior that you're actually trying to change in the first place. Okay. So let's talk about some of the really basic challenges for business. And this applies to so many dimensions of life, 
um, actually it could very much apply to romance as well getting customers to commit, getting people to commit. Okay, we know that's uh, the uh, endless problem in uh, relationships, isn't it? Okay, um, so getting customers to commit, you can give them the pitch. And then the old adage is, don't forget to ask for the sale. One of the most basic mistakes that uh, new inexperienced sales staff ask, uh, uh, make is, us, is forgetting to ask for the sale. Uh, a really basic problem, which is always joked about amongst vet veteran uh, sales staff. They say, forgot to ask for the sale. Explain the product, told, told them how good it was, the customer's standing there, and it just, nothing happens, okay? And then the customer just simply walks away. Um, I must say, older guys often look at younger guys, whether it's in uh, Yogi Park, or whether it's in um, cafes or whether it's by the Kaisatsuguchi just before the last train, you see the girl, the guy, or maybe the guy and the guy standing there looking at each other. She's all expect expectant, waiting for the pitch. Oh, there he is. Johnny. And off he goes. And you're like, ah, ah, forgot to ask for the sale. Okay. You got to get the customers to commit. People normally don't voluntarily commit to spending money, commit to a relationship, unless you give them a little bit of a nudge. Okay. By the way, some of the, uh, the worst playboys I've known almost invariably talked about metaphors of creating momentum. And they said the, uh, the art of the seduction is, is creating a highway with no exits. Oh, it's just horrible behavior. But uh, if you think about a lot of the uh, sales techniques that effective companies do, it kind of is like a highway with very few exits, okay? But it's a nice highway. You kind of are drawn inexorably towards spending money, signing up for something, that there are just not um, outs. And actually regulatory interventions to overcome a lot of bad sales behaviors are really about dealing with this. It's not only about creating cooling off periods or 72 hours where you can, uh, for example, even if you've signed the contract, you can get out of it in 72 hours. And we've understood that uh, particularly for a whole range of online services, whether it's software subscriptions or whatever, this initial trial uh, before you buy is absolutely critical. You see this in so many dimensions, whether it's an Amazon sample chapter and you get to the end of the chapter and then there's a link simply to then buy the, uh, the book. Uh, or whether it's um, pretty much any game now that has a cuck in function that has an in-app purchase, that's pretty much a standard model. To remove initial psychological resistance to committing to experiencing the good, that you go into trial mode and then from inside the app itself, uh, you can pay for it, okay? Another key thing with challenge, basic challenge is avoiding hold up. Hold up is a critical thing here. Um, we'll see this by staff, suppliers, a whole range of people. Anyone who provides something that is critical to you continuing your business can take advantage of you. And especially when your business is going well at a, at a critical stage. And we'll talk about these things. Avoiding lock-in. Lock-in is ubiquitous. Companies are looking to do this. Okay. Um, and of course, on the other hand, how do you uh, inflict it upon your customers and staff? How do you lock people in? Um, Japanese companies historically have... Um, been quite good at locking in core employees in with things like Taishokin, retirement funds, um, with seniority based wages, a whole range of things, uh, benefits that uh, you would forego if you left the company early. Waseda is absolutely terrible like this. Um, it took me a couple of years to realize what I'd quite done actually moving to Waseda from Australian University. I suddenly realized that, wow. Um, you either have to leave Waseda after a few years or you have to stay effectively a minimum of 15 years because all of the money you put in for your pension fund, Nenkin, for the first 10 years is not even refundable. After about 10 years, you get your own money back. Um, if you stay then 15 years, you will also get the, uh, the university contribution. So the economic costs of leaving are really high. Um, it's not always good, you know. Uh, there are there are times when organisations would like people to be able to go go away more easily. So it's a trade-off between wanting to keep you know keep people um, 
and um, wanting to be able to get rid of some people as well to make it easy for the bad ones to leave. By the way, a basic rule of thumb in business with hiring, and when we talk about HR, we'll talk further about this, is that um, good people leave after a few years, the bad ones stay forever. So that over time, unless you're very actively recruiting and um, fostering the development of your best employees, the average quality of your employees declines because the uh, the one the other people haven't got new people have got no options stay. Um, the ones who've got lots of options will leave unless you give them new roles, new responsibilities. So another challenge for business, of course, is discouraging competition legally, um, illegal ways to do it. Well, that's pretty straightforward. You just get the local gangsters to intimidate potential rivals, um, or you get the government to have a very strict licensing regime, uh, planning provisions where no one ever gets permission to open up a coffee shop next to your coffee shop. Why? Uh, because the person responsible for planning is your mum. Okay. So all of these things would be in, in societies where the law works well, quite um, uh, illegal, where the law doesn't work well, these things are actually quite uh, ubiquitous, okay? So also making sure you get a fair deal in business partnerships. And we'll talk about in the context of negotiation, uh, collaboration, where win-win deals grow the pie, but you still have to divide the pie. So it's quite possible to do a win-win deal, but have the other party get much more of the win than you. So you still have to look after your interests, even when it's uh, uh, a good mutual collaboration. And there are some really basic problems of credible commitments and credible th threats. Uh, this is a key discourse that we use in microeconomics, uh, game theory in general. So it's also applied a lot to international relations. Um, this idea of credible commitments and credible threats. Um, in a legal context, uh, context, this is very significant too. Lawyers are always looking about um, uh, not so much whether they're right or wrong, it's just whether someone can credibly threaten to sue you. And um, that's where it gets quite sobering because very often in the legal system, um, it favours people who have enough money to spend on legal action. It doesn't necessarily favour those who are most um, within the law. Okay, problem of trust, okay? Um, if you're walking down a dark street at night, um, anyone approaching you looks more threatening uh, than on a bright sunny day, okay? Uh, we are instinctively wary of things we and you know people we know nothing about. We can't make out the details. We're instinctively more nervous in dark places. We understand that. Okay, so framing is absolutely enormous uh, in terms of our perception of risk. Now, this is not rational. There is absolutely no reason to think that you are more likely to be suddenly attacked by a stranger in the dark at night than you are during daytime. But lots of people think, but hang on, but that all the time, all I say, I hear about all these terrible cases of what happened at night. Yeah. But lots of people get attacked in daytime as well too. But um, daytime, it doesn't look really scary, does it? In, uh, in dramas, in cinema and whatnot. Cinematographers very rarely show horrible random daytime attacks. Nighttime attacks, you can use the night to build tension. Um, that's also why the horror genre in Japan was so popular. It's also the cheapest way to make a movie, okay? I think all of you know that uh, from when you were six or seven years old, all you had to do was get a torch and hold it under your face and go, oh, okay, you know, and uh, you can look nice and terrifying. So we understand this. Um, we're instinctively a little bit afraid of the dark because we don't know what's coming um, at us. So. Hence the metaphor. In the, I'm in the dark about this. I'm really in the dark. It's uh, it's a metaphor for saying I just don't know um, at all. I'm confronted by uncertainty, and under conditions of uncertainty, we tend to to flip flop between being too optimistic and being too negative. Okay, so in trust, there's often too little of it and sometimes too much of it. Um, of course, businesses go to great effort to project value quality. It's no Apple that, you know, and of course, Apple makes uh, good products, but their stores are also transparent, high quality. I took a picture of this because I thought um, that's not the Apple shop that I want to go to. Um, does anyone want to walk into this place and buy some apples? Uh, me thinks not. Okay. That's in Nagano, by the way. Um, so, 
getting customers to, to commit, doesn't matter how good your product is, doesn't matter how decent a person you are, that they've never crossed your mind to rip someone off. Instinctively, customers feel it being ripped off, okay? And as a consequence, customers are hesitant to commit prior to checking market conditions. Um, this is a major reason why the first store often misses out on the sale, despite being competitive in price and quality. First store, as tourists enter a uh, market, for example, doesn't do as well as the second store. People go into the first store, they're afraid of being ripped off, they go out, they go to the second store, they see that the price is similar to the first store, um, but they've got no reason to favour the first store over the second, so they buy at the second store, okay? So generally, customers know their vulnerability. So customers are wary of one-shot iterations. One-shot iterations that you only deal with someone once, okay? Unlike a repeat game. Now, one shot, the vendor has incentive to cheat. This is why tourists get ripped off. Um, if you're off the tour, tour bus, the people selling it, whatever, you know, bottles of water, um, entombed warriors in, you know, in China and Xi'an that are reduced to this size, you know, um, People get off the tour bus and they're thinking, you know, American tourists, I think, oh, these people aren't coming back again. So I'll charge them 10 times the fair market price and they're on the back on the bus. I'll never see them again. Okay. So one of the things you need to do, of course, is uh, in the communication sense is always try and signal that this can be a repeat game. Uh, when you're obviously a foreigner, uh, you look much more vulnerable. Of course, one thing you can do is, you know, is to explicitly say, you know, I'm living here for a year. I'm just down the street. I'm living here for a year. And uh, so immediately that uh, restaurant knows, well, if we overcharge this guy, he won't come back. Um, he may come back uh, at least once or twice a week uh, for the next year because he told us he's here. Okay. Uh, so sending signals that you're looking to make this a repeat game is a very important thing. Um, I uh, go to two different florists and um, both of the florists, um, they always give me omake. They know that I'm a repeat customer. I'm a kind of a Jordan son. So I normally um, score a few extra flowers and extra little bars. And so I get a uh, very nice um, omake. Um, so if you go to a shop for the first time, because you're new in an area, make sure you explicitly say, look, I've just moved into the area. Um, it's really nice to find a florist or to find a bar or a coffee shop or whatever. Um, so that the people there know if we're good to this person, um, that person will come back regularly. Okay. Uh, now, another critical thing is this notion of lock-in. Okay. Um, and uh, we'll see in so many contexts, businesses are looking to try and lock you in. If you're about to run a startup airline, not a bad... <laughs> Not a good business to be in now. Uh, not a bad way to go bankrupt, I was going to say right now. Um, then uh, the decision you make about what kind of airplane you fly has massive lock-in implications because you have to pipe, um, hire pilots who can fly that kind of plane. You have to have engineers who can service them, the mechanics. You have to stock a, have a stock of the components. And this is um, one of the reasons, by the way, what LCCs tend to fly only one kind of airplane from one manufacturer. Um, it reduces their overall costs. On the other hand, um, it makes them very vulnerable to Boeing or Airbus, for example. So whatever decision you make about a huge array of things has potential lock-in. I am very much locked into the Apple ecology. All of my devices are Apple. Um, and I use iCloud for syncing everything. And uh, Apple, Apple owns me, right? Um, just uh, it's so much easier for me to use um, other Apple devices um, because I'm in the Apple ecology. So one needs to make uh, very thoughtful decisions in a whole range of consumer product areas. Um, and similarly, when, you, when you're adopting business systems and whatnot, this also leads to a whole range of tactics that those companies selling things are more likely to make it cheap for you upfront to get you into the system. Uh, cameras are the classic example. You know, I, I use Nikon and um, I've got uh, over on a shelf behind me a whole bunch of old Nikon cameras and lenses and whatnot that I was using when I was a university student. Um, 
I've got a bunch from when my dad had his photography studio. Um, I'm now got the Nikon Z mount, but I've still got the adapter. I can use all my old lenses. So to switch to another system such as Fuji or Sony or Canon would actually be very, very costly for me um, because it's not just about the camera bodies. It's about all of the lenses uh, that go with it. Okay. Now, a really important thing with dist distrust, the dark is one thing, but in general, circumstances create distrust. Okay. Don't be offended if people um, suspect your character. Okay. Let's assume you're a really good person. Uh, don't be insulted if people think otherwise. Okay. Try to manage perceptions and signal trustworthiness. Um, by the way, this was also in Glasgow and you see a purple light coming through in a back street and you may think it is a house of ill repute, uh, as the English would say. Uh, this was actually a um, Christian drop-in center, okay? This is where nuns were um, offering um, consultation to people troubled and wanting some life advice. And uh, it is an interesting thing, probably the purple light and all the rest of it. Maybe this is uh, very deliberate. People um, who, who are looking for company um, of a certain kind, actually they want the company and someone just simply to talk to. So you could read this in one way um, or you could read it in a completely different way. And most people tend to read it in a more lewd kind of way. Okay, so lock in, whole range of things, printers, cartridges, we know this, that's why printers are cheap and the ink is expensive. Four o'clock in the morning last night, I was looking around for a um, light cyan um, ink cartridge. Uh, so that I could actually uh, print out um, copies of the uh, the lecture notes. Uh, so having to change the ink and uh, cursing that I have to go and spend more money um, with Epson. Um, the printer was cheap, but the, uh, the cartridges are terrible. So a whole lot of specialist infrastructure, software, all of these kind of things um, have very significant lock-in. Uh, I, for many years, told my father change his email address to Gmail or Hotmail or something because he was using the email address that was provided to him by his ISP, his internet service provider. And uh, he wouldn't change the internet service provider uh, because he would lose his email address that everybody knew. Um, and for about five years, they managed to spectacularly overcharge him because um, he felt this sense of lock-in. Um, number portability in Japan, it had to be regulated. Of course, the mobile phone companies were ruthless. They wouldn't release the phone numbers um, until the government told them they had to, which meant that you, you gave everyone your phone number. You therefore couldn't change companies because you would have to change your number. That was just a shameless lock-in. There is so much lock-in around. Um, Japanese universities lock you in. In Australia, universities are all government uh partially funded, government owned in a sense, so it's, it's legally more complicated. Um, but very importantly, about 20 odd years ago, uh, government policy really pushed the units, uh, the universities to give credit for transfer. So universities faced losing their students to other universities. And when I used to work for Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, um, one of the things that the faculty members used to do at the beginning of each semester was we had these in credit sessions where I would sit there at a table Students would come in with their academic transcript and supporting documents. They'd come from Griffith or Central Queensland University or whatever. And they say, I want to transfer to QUT. How much credit will you give me? And I'd look there and we'd have precedent books and on the spot, I'd say, okay, well, yeah, I'll give you a full year's credit for the year's study you've done. Um, and I'd sign that off. They'd take the form over. Uh, in 15 minutes, they could be signed up at the rival university, transfer their credit. And uh, of course, the other universities in the city of Brisbane hate, hated us doing it. Um, but what it meant was that the universities felt a lot of competitive pressure to improve the student experience because students could move from one university to another. Okay. So um, what are the really basic implications for lock-in? Significant pricing implications. When the lock-in is strong, you sell the product very cheaply to the customer, get them to commit, and then bleed them dry, ramp up the prices. And, you know, there's been horrible things in the mobile phone business in Japan. You know, you have this uh, shibari, they used to call it shibari, now the, uh, the rules are a little bit more liberal, but that's because the government forced them to be liberal, where unless in a one month period at the end of a Ninen Keiaku two year contract, uh, they would charge Ichiman in to break a contract. So to roll onto another two years and there was this pretense that they were giving you a discount, but they weren't. Um, it was actually much higher than market rates. Um, 
you know, when I switched from Docomo to UQ Mobile, I cut my phone bill by two thirds, no diminishment in the customer experience and data and whatnot. Um, but actually to switch, I had to pay an Ichiman in break fee, uh, which I saved in, in no time uh, because the ripoff was actually so bad. Um, a significant part of lock-in is just the psychological dimension of this. And this is part of what we talk about with switching costs. Um, switching costs are borne by the customer to switch supplier. And there's also, when we talk about total switching costs it's to the economy or the industry, plus the new provider's cost of taking on the new customer. Now, one of the major reasons in Japan why universities don't take henyusei very often, so you know, students are transferred from one university to another, is because the, the government regulates the total number of students, okay? Ten, uh, so the number of enrollments. And um, the rules are quite perverse in the sense that um, there's, there's an incentive to take lots of new students and much less incentive to take um, students who transfer subsequently, because if students who transfer also counted in the team, um, even though they've got students quitting. So a lot of the rules have an impact on switching and whether that's an attractive thing to encourage or to discourage. So the customer switching costs, the search costs itself, um, in terms of information and facilitation, one of the really big growth areas are comparison sites in Japan, kakaku.com. Um, these days, of course, anyone who buys anything, I think, looks at kakaku.com. Most interestingly, I've found these days that the sales staff in Bikuro Yorubashi, they show you kakaku.com. In the past, you know, you kind of secretly look and then talk to them and the prices would be different. These days, they know everybody does that. So they match it on the spot. Um, and if they don't, you pull out kakaku.com and they will match it. Normally, they'll match it with points. And that's something we'll come back to in a moment. Okay, um, so remember that a lot of services firm um, completely defend, depend on customer switching costs and inertia. Um, sports clubs are the classic ones. Um, if everyone who had a gym membership turned up and wanted to use the pool at the same time, it would be, as the Japanese expression goes, imo arai. It'd be like washing potatoes, okay? It would just be you know, sports clubs. The economic premise of them is that people are optimistic about how often they'll use the club and they don't use it as much. And if even a fraction of the members all turned up at the same time, well, you, obviously you'd have a huge corona cluster right now, um, but uh, there'd be no equipment to use. The pool would be over overwhelmed and whatnot, okay? So a critical set of issues is to um, think yourself in terms of the commitments you make, understand that when you get particularly busy, um, the psychological or the time component of switching is quite high. And so you can end, or end up spending a lot of money with subscriptions that you don't use, but forget to unsubscribe from. And I'm terrible at that. I, and summer holidays, I've got to go and um, stop paying for a whole bunch of things I'm not using. So how to avoid lock-in, okay? Well, avoid becoming dependent on proprietary systems or standards. Um, apps, for example, uh, several ways of lock-in these days. Uh, so many apps want to store your data in their cloud service. That's a classic lock-in strategy. It's also a subscription strategy to get you to pay month by month rather than a once-off purchase for the app, okay? Um, that all of that uh, leads to stable cash flow for them and higher switching costs for you. So try and avoid that. Um, I look, for example, with apps that allow um, syncing with Dropbox and allow storage in Dropbox because I've drop, got Dropbox anyway. So they just they they're um, they're just an end-on um, app that adds to an existing cloud service that you've got rather than their own. So inter, in general, look for interoperability. Um, this is why Sony failed with its Betamax format years ago with video cassettes, because it was um, depending its tightly protecting its proprietary system. Sony always does this. This is, this is always Sony trying to create an exclusive ecology and lock people in. They did this with memory stick I mentioned earlier. Um, whereas a consortium of other Japanese electronic uh, manufacturers adopted the VHS standard, which wasn't as good a standard as Betamax. Sony's Betamax were used um, in television stations for years. Um, Betamax was 
more compact, higher quality, but VHS became predominant because it had interoperability. It didn't lock people into one manufacturer's devices, for example. So one way to do this in business is to have dual sourcing or multiple um, sourcing. So what we actually see is defense departments, for example, um, the United States, the Australians, the French, they all do this. They often kind of consciously overpay contractors um, to keep them in business so that they've got multiple potential suppliers, particularly if they need to scale up capacity at times of a national um, emergency. Um, as I say in the slides, he'd be very wary of one-stop shops, and you'll see this all the time, your total solutions provider. Sounds good, sounds convenient, except that uh, they kind of own you, okay? It's very difficult when you've handed over um, for example, all of your um, investments to a, to a provider, what we call a wrap product or a, a, a total solutions provider, you're particularly exposed to their systems, for example. So also we'll see um, a whole range of lock-in things such as you buy a photocopying machine and it's got a warranty, Hosho Kikan, but that's conditional upon using the paper that the company provides and that paper is charged at a higher price. So we see a lot of things like this. Loyalty programs are effectively designing, um, um, designing lock-in in, in, in a sweet kind of way, kind of golden handcuffs. Uh, some people get really obsessive about loyalty programs. Um, I'm, I am a strong believer in, when we can get back to traveling, cleverly collecting frequent flyer points, um, particularly through using credit cards, for example. Um, but I see a lot of people being psychologically overly influenced by loyalty programs. I see people doing silly things of not taking direct flights, but adding hours to their journey to go via another place and to transfer, which means you're always exposed to the risk of two flight delays rather than one, and just simply a waste of time. They're doing this because they earn points, for example, on this one airline, um, rather than taking the direct flight. That to me just simply never makes sense. Um, particularly people get really obsessed about getting enough points to get a status threshold, so they get priority check-in, for example. So they waste many, many hours taking indirect flights, um, flight connections, in order to save 15 minutes checking in a few times a year um, at the business check-in, for example. I, often doesn't add up. But I think there's also um, an interesting status thing. You know, some people really get a kick out of walking, walking past the lineup of people in economy um, and getting priority check-in that they feel special. Well, good luck to them, but yeah. Um, it's a remarkably liberating actually when you get over those kind of feelings. Okay, another important thing, think about the contract period. A long product life cycle may still lock you in. Um, just simply buying a certain kind of equipment locks you in for longer term. I've kind of been semi locked into Nikon since um, I uh, was, well, um, well, I think about my dad having Nikon equipment since I was about six, then I guess I've been locked in since then. Okay, because I could always use his gear. Okay, so dilemmas. Okay, basic dilemma. When the lock-in risk is evident, um, obviously, even though the lock-in risk is evident, there are significant efficiencies that can be gained from using one supplier alone. And I mentioned the example of airlines. So the fleet efficiencies, common aircraft reduce those servicing and maintenance costs. Um, and ultimately, uh, there are competitive disciplines on both Boeing and Airbus exploiting airlines that only use their planes. Um, the sheer openness of it. So if either of those airlines take advantage of their customers, then that's going to be devastating for their new business. So openness about um, your, customer, uh, your customer's experience is the biggest discipline upon yourself. What this means, of course, is that the rise of these information sharing sites, review sites and whatnot, are incredibly powerful disciplines upon companies. I, I, I wanna be very, very clear about this, that um, the best discipline upon bad businesses, bad capitalist practice is actually 
customer reviews rather than government regulation. The two nicely complement in, in a way if there is a huge outcry from customers, of course, businesses themselves are in danger of losing customers, um, but also the threat of regulatory action that follows on from that helps. Um, but at the end of the day, um, the information to the many is the best discipline upon companies because they do care about their reputation unless they're a, uh, a monopoly. Okay. Um, so there's this question of credible commitment and threat. As I say, you know, this, is, this was a, a big meeting of bikies in London to protest an increase on taxes for motorbikes. Now, if you've ever been in a bar somewhere, um, oh, those who are 18 and 19 have never been in a bar, of course, um, but if you've been abroad and uh, you suddenly see some bikies walk in, bikies are very good at looking very persuasive. You know, you generally don't want to get into an argument. Um, with bikies, okay? Um, so even if they are the most gentle, um, peace-loving people on the planet, they're pretty good at projecting the alternative, okay? So game theory and psychology can kind of help you. You don't necessarily have to become as scary as say a Hells Angels um, bikie. Okay, so one of the really important things to understand is cre um, credible threats. Are people making credible threats, okay? Um, there are plenty of times when people make threats uh, when they're unlikely to carry it out because it's not in their interest to do so. You know, young kids are pretty quick to figure out that when mum says, um, I'm going to disown you, um, I'm going to throw you in the street, I'm going to make you homeless, I'm going to leave you in a coin locker, kids are pretty quick to have to be very heady kids and come back and say, if you do that, you're going to get arrested. Uh, and most kids by the age of about seven or eight have at least picked it up from school, if not from TV, that most of the stuff that mum and dad threaten is actually not very credible. Um, probably because they love you. And even if they don't, um, um, someone's going to come and arrest mum or dad um, if they don't look after you. And for that very reason, uh, the biggest challenge in parenting is to actually learn to make credible threats. Okay. Um, interestingly, uh, things like um, blackmail only work when people don't understand the legal context associated with someone is blackmailing you just simply lure them into putting their blackmailing threat in a text or something and then say, this is a very serious criminal offense. Shall I go to the police? And you can end up blackmailing them for blackmailing you, which is kind of ironic. Okay. Um, so any kind of deadlines or threats that the other pass, other, other party doesn't want to enforce. Um, a friend of my brother's um, who got out of prison fairly recently <laughs> uh, said that one of the things that he learned interestingly in prison uh, was that uh, the, there's, there's an expression amongst people in being in prison. If someone says they're going to kill you, it's not a credible threat. Um, and the standard response amongst people who have been amongst people in prison is generally to say, if you're going to do it, you would have already done it. Um, because apparently in prison, when someone stabs you, they never announce it in advance. They just do it. Okay. You just suddenly find yourself being stabbed in the shower with a sharpened fork or something like that. So the people who tend to talk tough, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to do you. Um, the best response is to say, well, if you're going to, you would have already done it. Uh, the only problem with that is now you've backed them into a corner and you've kind of shamed them. So they may not have actually been serious. But when you call their bluff, sometimes pride takes over and then they do kill you. So the better thing to do is to actually think to yourself, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, if you're going to, you would have already done it. Okay. Because um, of course, you know, killing, killing someone very publicly has downsides for people doing the killing. Okay. Uh, so think a lot about credible threats. Um, one of the biggest challenges in highly conflicted relationships is people make vastly uh, inflated threats to each other that just are not practical. Um, I'm going to walk out. I'm going to leave you. I'm never going to see you again. It's like, um, you got no money. You got nowhere to go. Um, yeah, I'm not really convinced by that. Okay. It's really quite liberating actually. Uh, when you realize that people make incredible threats, uh, incredible threats. Um, the question is only then whether you laugh at them or not. Okay. Um, what we do see 
uh, though, is in situations of hold up, of lock in and things like that, um, real dilemmas arrive, okay? Uh, if someone has taken advantage of you or giving you a lousy service, but they're providing something that's critical to you, um, if you're unforgiving, it can be really costly to you. Canceling an order because the supplier is late leaves the customer without the needed product. You know, if you're uh, organizing a wedding and uh, the cake hasn't arrived on time or the flowers haven't arrived on time, telling them to say is, uh, calling them up and saying, hurry up or I'll never use you again is a lot better than saying, forget it, you're late, don't deliver it because the bride's not going to be happy if the, uh, obviously if the flowers aren't there. Of course, short-term forgiveness leads to long-term declines in performance and higher costs. And this, this is a recurrent problem. And you will, re you will discover there's a whole lot of people who effectively routinely are drama, drama queens. And I use that in a non-gendered sense because guys are just as much drama queens um, who want to hold you up at your most difficult times and extract benefits from you. Um, my advice there is stay calm, um, put up with it, get what you need from them at the time. Um, but make a big mental note to yourself, you will pay for this, okay? And I will not use you again. Okay, so how do we get credible? Um, first of all, eliminate options for backing down. This is uh, often referred to as the burn, um, burn your boat strategy. There's a famous story about an English army which um, besieged a French castle. Um, and the French thought, well, the English will eventually go away, so we'll just, we'll just um, hang out in the castle. Um, and the English are outside and they're in tents and we're, we're in a castle. So it's actually better in the bad weather. And then uh, lo and behold, the English burnt their boats and the French said, oh, they can't go home now. They're not going anywhere. These people are serious about killing us. And therefore they came to a compromise. Okay. So burning your boats, your bridges, um, signaling that there's no way of backing out of a deal. Uh, in a smaller sense, bond posting is a way to do this. I'm putting money down um, to show that you're really serious about committed to a project. The best way to win confidence about your commitment to a project is to have an irrevocable deposit of money up front, which you're going to lose if you do not deliver. Okay, so lock in uh, for credibility. Okay, your own investment joint project has this similar kind of thing, but also a lot of it is reputational. Um, a significant reason for wedding ceremonies is there's a kind of reputational lock-in. You know, you stand in front of your grandma and you say, you know, to have, you know, to have and to hold and to build until this, this, uh, from this day forth until death us do part. Um, you know, the most difficult thing uh, for everyone I know who's been through a divorce is actually telling mum and dad and grandma and everything. You came to my wedding and you brought a nice present and actually it hasn't worked out. Um, by the way, normally in that situation, mum and dad and grandma just give you a hug and it's like, whatever you want, dear, because in the end, they're your mikata, they're on your side. Okay, um, giving up control is often a significant thing. Binding yourself. Um, there are a whole bunch of things here. Uh, very famously, the tale of Ulysses in Greek tragedy. He feared the siren's call, the temptation of these evil spirits that turned themselves into the form of beautiful women and lured sailors to their deaths. Um, so Ulysses very famously has been told about this in advance. So he ties himself to the mast of the ship with a rope um, to stop himself being tempted. So giving up control. Um, I uh, heard bizarre anecdotes of people um, and never get into this stuff. It's crazy. Um, first of all, never buy a chemical product made by criminals. That's just, they do not care about health. Okay. Um, but people who bought these um, party drugs uh, to go to raves, which makes you really manic, really high, you know, dance for 12 or 14 hours. One of the side effects is that you're also likely to go crazy with your credit card and, and go shopping. So people who drop a tab um, and then uh, the effects linger into Sunday and they go to the mall with their credit card and buy $2,000 worth of clothes. So I'd heard that people who are dropping party drugs were posting their credit cards to themselves Friday night, put it in an envelope, post it back to yourself. So it arrives on Monday after the drugs have worn off. Uh, the much better solution is don't take the drugs. <laughs> okay. It's just, I mean, it's absolutely, if you find yourself doing that, I mean, that is the ultimate state of losership. It means that you completely rationally understand uh, how irrational you be, you are being. Okay. Um, but the way, you know, the places people put themselves in. Okay. But giving up control in some circumstances makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, 
Really importantly, setting an example, frighten many with one threat made public. I used to team teach very large classes at a university in Australia, Queensland University of Technology, um, 300 students, 350 students. I team taught with a, someone's a very good friend of mine, um, and very good friends. He used to be an army officer, and he always used to amaze me walking to the first class, and he'd say, now, let's make an example of someone. And he'd pick out someone who'd be like reading a magazine or something. Um, and we'd blast the person. And it was always very interesting because he would say, you know, you get angry at one in front of 300. Um, the 300 all stop. They look, they enjoy the spectacle. It's like, you know, someone being thrown to the lions in the Colosseum. And at the same time, they think, Thank God that's not me. And he said he was taught this in officer's school in the army. Okay. Um, you do not privately discipline people. You very publicly discipline people because you only have to discipline one to make everyone else behave well. This is what the Japanese prosecutors do all the time. Have you noticed every time the Japanese prosecutors raid um, a company, the blue vans pull up and everyone gets out with the uh, dumb border, cardboard boxes and they all go in to do the no uh, tori Um Just by chance, all the TV stations are there. Isn't it a miracle that all the TV stations um, just happen to be passing these places where Japanese prosecutors, Japanese police are raiding companies, okay? No, it's no accident whatsoever. Um, there is a very intimate relationship between the media, too much so, the media gets incredibly lazy because, um, this story is all depend on leaks from the prosecutors, but the prosecutors understand this, that um, if you arrest one person, you terrify a hundred other people into behaving well. Um, finally, in terms of being credible, it does help to look a little bit crazy, okay? Um, it's no accident that gangsters get themselves tattooed, um, partly to increase the switching costs. Uh, if someone gets arrested and they go to prison, okay, um, they're not going to rat out other gang members because like your gang name is written on your forehead. Okay. Um, you're not going to be a traitor. Uh, you are literally branded. Um, but another really important thing is it just intimidates people. That's why, you know, bikies know how to look scary. Okay. Um, it, looking a little bit crazy can be good for business. It enhances the credibility of your threat. Okay. Um, for example, revenge is almost never rational, but if you think someone is going to take horrible revenge upon you, then you're more likely to be well behaved. Uh, there was a very popular bumper sticker, I think it was produced by the NRA, the National Rifle Association in the United States, um, which and I'm for gun control. Um, I grew up with guns, but I'm, I'm for gun control. Actually, my father was president of a pistol, major pistol shooting club. And so I'm a damn good shot with a pistol, but I don't think people should freely walk around with pistols. Um, it should be tight regime. But there was a very popular bumper sticker in America, which said an armed society is a polite society. An armed society is a polite society. And there is some truth in that. You know, you, you kind of think twice about giving someone the middle finger salute, you know, in America, because they might pop you with a gun. Um, so this, this idea that, that things can turn quite nasty, you know, that the, um, the playboy does face the serious prospect of having the crazy ex-lover writing bastard in lipstick across the, uh, you know, the windscreen of the family car. Um, try explaining that to the missus. It's like, hmm, some random person wrote bastard in lipstick on the windscreen of the family car. Why did that happen? Okay. Um, so you only need to hear those stories to be tempted to behave better rather than worse. Well, a little bit in terms of discouraging new competitors. Okay. Um, actually, we often think just aggressively discount and scare people off. It doesn't work very well because price is actually too easy to change. It's not a very credible threat. Okay. Um, lock in through aggressive investment in new productive capacities is much more credible. In the airline industry, for example, if rumors emerge that um, a new LCC is about to appear in the market, very often the existing players will announce that they've just signed up to buy 30 new Airbus planes as a way of saying, you want to compete, we'll compete. Okay. Um, 
you can preemptively lock in clients with long contracts, but the clients see that coming and they, they want to get paid for that. Okay. The, the public commitment component is perhaps the, uh, the bit, the, the most significant takeaway lesson here. And, um, the bottom slide here, signaling mutual commitment. Um, this couple here, I snuck up behind them and took a picture. It's like, you really got to be in love to wear matching purple, uh, sorry, orange shirts. I slipped out purple because I've got another example in mind. Um, it's very interesting if you're in um, Seoul Airport, uh, as I was during prime wedding season on one Sunday afternoon, afternoon you see so many Shinkon new couples with pear look, okay? I'm just amazed how many guys get talked into that. Matching sneakers, matching polo shirts, all the rest of it. It's like, we're in love. Or at very least, the guy can't say no, okay? So very strong kind of signaling effect. You know, the things we'll do for love. There is a song by Meatloaf on the things I'll do for love, but I won't do that, okay? Um, in my case, I would certainly not do the, uh, the pair look. Okay, so I'll um, briefly stop the share screen. I want to turn to negotiation. Now, I know a few of you are actually in my intermediate seminar, um, which is all about negotiation. It's been a little bit difficult to do this semester completely online. Um, those of you, let me take a sweep here. A little bit of an announcement related to that, actually. Um, I normally run a corporate case study with Nissan, an advanced course in the fall. Um, but because of the, uh, the possibility of at least partial virtual delivery still. We don't quite know how things are going to go. That's not going to happen this semester. So it looks like I'm going to be running another intermediate seminar, Chukyu Inshu, on persuasion um, and negotiation in the fall instead. So if people are interested in this topic, then you'll be eligible for an intermediate seminar in the fall. That um, is a kind of unexpected uh, option. Okay, now, um, let me see. Uh, one exercise I'm just looking at. Oh, intensive. Right. I'll go back to the screen share. Okay. Um, take one more swig of the drink. I did, I did want to leave a little bit of time for Q and A, but um, I, I've packed this. Um, uh, pretty tightly this week. Uh, normally I would actually cover these over um, two weeks in a regular class and do a little breakout exercise in the classroom and everything, um, but we, uh, we can't do that. Um, historically, following that notion of the armed society being a polite society um, and also being military cultures and the status of aristocrats and whatnot tied to the military function, we had long traditions of dueling, for example, um, one of the logics there was that societies were very pol polite, particularly because at any, at any point, if someone felt insulted, they could issue a challenge to a duel. Um, you would take off your glove and you would either throw it at the foot of the other person and say, sir, I challenge you. I, I demand satisfaction, which would meet in the morning and you kill each other. Um, bizarre kind of satisfaction. Um, or slap someone across the face with your glove. That was absolutely guaranteed to get someone to have to agree to face your challenge. Um, kind of a silly era. Um, fortunately, aristocrats no longer rule the world. Uh, business people effectively do. And they understand that the vast majority of human interactions are actually win-win collaborative pie growing deals. Um, aristocrats had tend to fixed incomes and a lot of pride and too much time on their hands. So they engaged in often destructive social competition. Um, uh, someone who can swallow their pride uh, and look for the win-win uh, is more likely to do well in our modern society. So integrative deals create value by bringing two parties together to find their complementary interests. And the important thing is to find the complementary interests. The very famous example, it's in every negotiations textbook, it's in my intermediate seminar textbook as well too, is two people fighting over one orange. Um, Turns out that uh, one person wants the zest, the, the skin, or the uh, part of the skin, the outer part of the skin, uh, to make an orange cake. The other person wants the juice to drink it, or the fruit to eat it. 
if they share information about their intent, it's they are completely complementary interests. One person gets a full zest, the skin, the other person gets the full fruit. If they don't share the information and they resort to the lazy distributional solution of cutting it down the middle, both people miss out on something, okay? So the distributive component is sharing the fixed pie. Most negotiations have elements of, bar, of both. Okay, um, we tend to hear negotiation and we tend to think it's all about being a tough ass, being really tough and don't any more makina your knee. Um, actually, a simple fundamental truth is uh, people who ask more questions, who are more positive, who actually have more faith in the potential for people to be good are actually likely to do better in business. If you generally think that other people are going to exploit you, take advantage of you and you behave in a similar way, you miss out on a lot of opportunities. Unfortunately, that is Donald Trump. You may wonder how come Donald Trump's so rich. Well, Donald Trump is a very good example of someone who inherited a large business and became a successful smaller business owner, okay? Um, that uh, it kind of shrunk over time, that he uh, repeatedly squandered the enormous wealth that his father bestowed on him with bad deals, and he's a very distrustful person, okay? So preparing for a negotiation, any kind of business dealing, and, and I don't necessarily mean a formal sit-down negotiation, it can just be a kind of a face-to-face -face meeting, it can be virtual, it can be anything. Um, obviously you want to find those points of common interest prior to the negotiation, because if you approach it in a creative problem-solving kind of way, you're going to see lots of new opportunities. If you're very defensive, just drawing drawing a kind of a stop loss position or a defensive line, um, you won't be open to win-win solutions. You want to consider a wide range of options and outcomes. Think of a spectrum of possibilities. Um, you'll be much more open to good propositions then. So you should plan your objectives around ranges rather than a single fi fixed point. Um, don't say, I'm not going to sell this for less than $100. Keep yourself open-minded because someone might give you a nice creative solution uh, that you hadn't thought of. Also, bargain across a set of issues rather than one issue at a time because the trade-offs are across issues. This is why international trade negotiations are incredibly complicated. You know, 150, 160 countries involved and literally hundreds of issues. So it takes years. Literally, you need spreadsheets to map, to map, just map the issues, let alone to do the sums. Information is always your best we uh, weapon. Skilled negotiators get as much illicit. They get as much information from the other party. So ask lots of questions, short questions, open questions. Find out their constraints, their wants. Um, when people don't want to do things, ask them why. And don't waste too much time debating those conflicting perceptions. One way when people don't want to give up information is actually to use a reactive approach. Offer a proposal and then see what they welcome and what they reject. And this, this is like how we often define our taste. We often know more what we don't want or what we don't like rather than what we do like. In fact, what we do like is often almost a residual of all the things we, uh, we don't like. Now, there are some basic perceptual traps. One of the most significant one, and, and I think it's probably an evolutionary element to this. Um, a lot of people, ev evolutionary psychologists, uh, de debate about this. On the one hand, um, society, human society evolved in a cooperative fashion. You know, if you're, um, it's very difficult to kill a woolly mammoth, for example, um, by yourself. Uh, you normally needed a whole bunch of people to surround it, confuse it, and number of people to throw spears at it and, and whatnot, okay, and then to share it. So depending on, of course, on the, on, the, on the environmental conditions people found themselves in. Agriculture, of course, needs cooperation too. So there's the cooperative tendency, but we're also hardwired to defend um, scarce assets. You know, it's, it's our woolly mammoth, go get your own, okay, kind of thing. So there is an excessive tendency to perceive zero-sum games, to perceive that the pie is fixed. Um, and so we often are too negative about other people's success. I even heard a uh, professor in political science saying you about someone, you can't have that much money without being a bit evil. And as a business 
kind of professor, I said, uh, no, uh, you can have that much money if you create something that brings enormous value to people. The two richest guys in Australia are two young guys who created a great um, software development collaboration platform, which people in the industry absolutely love. It made their work so much easier to do. And so now they have the two most expensive houses in Australia and Sydney Harbour next to each other um, so that they can talk to each other over their fences, <laughs> or sit on their, their beaches together. Um, together, it's $150 million worth of real estate. And they're also the two most generous donors recently to a whole range of charities. Um, so these, these are good guys and they got rich because they created value for people. But the instinct is envy. And we see this COVID-19, a lot of bad consumer behavior, for example, you know, buckle guy and whatnot. We tend to think that we've got to get in before other people do. If you, if you want a classic example of conflict perceptual traps leading to a duel, the great Russian poet, Alexander Pushkin, with his very famous poem, um, Onegin talks about how a guy ends up killing his best friend in a duel because um, they have a disagreement with this crazy downward spiral into conflict. The film is very good. Pushkin wrote this and then he himself died in exactly the same way. So people, even when they see it, don't learn the lessons from themselves. That's why this is in Edinburgh Castle, for example, oh, the, duel, the dueling pistols all lined up ready for people to go and shoot each shoot each other okay um do understand the structural properties of conflicts by the way russian dueling rules the they kept shooting until someone got wounded the english are much more pragmatic um two shots had to be fired and um you didn't even seriously have to try and shoot the other person so you might meet in the morning and you'd fire in the air and this was quite common they just fire in the air and the other person would fire in the air and then they'd have go and breakfast have breakfast together okay you know Judy had me done more. Ichio katachi dake de? Ah, no. Whereas in the Russian case, and it says, it says something about the Russian, Russian perceptions of the fixed pie, someone must get hurt, okay, um, historically. Um, this is a powerful image. Um, sorry to say, this is a bit shocking, but this is on display in the Danish National uh, Museum. This was used to chop the head off. Um, one of Denmark's most famous leaders, a guy called Strunzi. Um, he was a liberal dictator, he modest means. Um, simply put, he became the most powerful person in Denmark. Um, he was the son of a minister. Um, he was the advisor to the king, who was quite mad. Mark, Nihongo Rira, Choshi no te, Choshi no Risugi Chia te, Korosareta. Okay, so he got a little bit cocky to the point where he actually apparently became the lover of the queen, uh, the wife of the king he served, and didn't even bother to hide the fact, and the aristocrats were appalled by it, and he was put to death. And uh, yeah, so I think every Danish kid who's been dragged along to the museum by their parents or their school teachers look at that and got that lesson, hmm, stay humble. Okay, especially when you're doing good things, because he was quite a liberal reformer. Okay, I got a choice not enough. Okay, is the takeaway lesson. Um, okay, so negotiation dialogue, a couple of final things. Um, looking at our tight time here. Um, to a remarkable degree, communication strategy makes a huge impact. Use people's names, not too much, it's like really creepy, too much, but um, try and remember people's names, uh, refer to them by name and uh, they're more likely to like you. Uh, also signal in advance what you're going to say so people can prepare for it. Uh, be polite. May I ask a question? It gets people's attention. May I ask a question? And then just ask the question and everyone will lean in and pay attention. And uh, generally, if you disagree and you're going to argue against someone, don't say, I disagree. Oh, nonsense, I want a load of rubbish. The moment you say that, they stop listening to the reason. All they hear is that you disagree. They're not interested in why you disagree. You say, better say, hmm, that's interesting. I see what you're saying. At the same time, um, I'm a little bit concerned that your idea is completely stupid uh, and you explain why, okay? Also make sure confirming understanding and summarizing. Uh, people who are good in any business situation 
or in, after a business meeting, send an email with a brief summary of their understanding of the content. Uh, what did we agree on? Okay. And write to get their, their confirmation. A couple of other tips in terms of communications, avoid needless adjectives. I'm going to make you a great offer, the best offer you've ever had. It's like, people are like, I'll decide if it's a good offer. Okay. If you're going to make them an offer, just simply make them an offer. Don't even say, I'll make you an offer. Just simply make the proposal to them. Okay. Why? If you use lots of good adjectives about yourself, Donald Trump, it's going to be great. It's going to be good. You know, this is the best deal that's ever been done for America. Everyone goes, oh, Christ. Okay. And uh, immediately kind of discount it. It just annoys. Okay. Obviously, don't be rude to the other party. Don't be lousy, deceit. You know, call them lousy, deceitful, dumb, all the rest of it. That's not to say you shouldn't get angry. There are times when you definitely should get angry because otherwise you'd look weak. Okay. Critical thing. Hairdressers are great at this. All good salespeople are good at this. Find something in common with the other party so they can connect with you. It can be anything. You, you know, you, you're both from Corbett or any connect, anything that is a connection. And people in business keep track. Um, people who do well at business keep track of the personal details of people they're dealing with to make that connection. Um, because at the end of the day, you want people to empathize with you to see your common humanity. Um, and it's effectively can save you a lot of money and build good collaborative relationships in terms of being convincing. Don't give people five reasons to do something. The last people, the last thing people want is to kind of, you know, the PowerPoint presentation, you should fall in love with me because one, two, three, four, five, and most days are like, oh, Kim won't. Okay. So people want one good reason to do something. If that reason doesn't work, give them another reason. Okay. One at a time. Okay. And also one of the most effective things is to show that you're self-aware, self-reflective, run a commentary on your own feelings in response to positions. And it's like a meta narrative. And it also means rather than get angry, tell them, you know, I'm starting, I'm actually, I'm, I'm starting to feel angry. Um, but I probably, I, 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 I must have misunderstood something. I shouldn't be feeling that. I know you don't want to make me angry. Um, I haven't slept enough, so it's probably just me, but let me double check why I'm feeling what I'm doing. Okay. So talking about feelings and talking about talking. Okay. Um, finally, um, I actually, with some Zemi say, actually, you this interesting thing. We won this, um, competition to go, I went with three Zemise to present their Sotsodon to an international conference in uh, the UK. Uh, and we all went to a pub, this was in Edinburgh. Um, and we all went to a pub and uh, there was this couple next to us. Um, and this, it sounds horribly gendered to say it, but the girl, she was insane. She was just insane. But this guy, he obviously didn't want to be alone. And we were kind of drinking our drinks like, man, no, go, get away, get away, get away while you got the chance, get away while you chance. But, you know, cut your losses, escape now. But as you can see, the look on his face, he was in love. Uh, no, he's probably still paying for that. Okay. Um, don't let time constraints or last minute demands cause you to agree to a bad deal. And one of the biggest mistakes people make in negotiation is... They want to go home with something to show for it. Okay. Um, there's, there's, there's an old bad joke and excuse the rudeness, but you know, the old joke is, um, you know, if you're not in bed by midnight, it's time to go home. Okay. Um, uh, don't succumb to that, that kind of mindset, this idea that, uh, I want something to show for it. Okay. A lot of people get themselves in a very bad situation that way. Uh, similarly, you're in a business negotiation. There are plenty of times when to say, actually, this is not going in a good direction. Yes, I spent weeks on this, but this is not going to be good for us. We'll walk away. Let's cut our losses on this. It's hard to do it. Most bad shopping decisions are made when they're starting to play old Lang Syne, you know? Um, you hear the music and you think, oh God, I've, I've tried on 20 things and these don't feel right. Ah, my ear. Okay. So that kind of last minute, by the way, many of the most exploitative negotiation tactics involve um, second bite tactics where just when you think the deal is done and you're feeling satisfied, we finally got a deal. 
they ask for a last minute concession. And you've already kind of got the champagne on ice ready to celebrate uh, the deal. So you make this concession because you want the oi way, okay? Um, and some people always pull that stunt on you to ask and wait at the last minute to try and get a favor. Um, moments like that, uh, when you really should get angry, lots of research shows that's the moment to, to say, okay? And generally they will give in um, and you'll get the original deal. But uh, think about this, most of the mistakes you will make um, in terms of negotiation and mistakes in life come when you've slept too little, uh, too little time to think about your options, under pressure, too many things um, on your mind. So try and develop a lot of um, basic messages to yourself and other people to say, um, look, I've got enough on my mind right now. I cannot make a commitment on this. You'll have to get me at a better time. So to guard yourself from bad decisions. Okay, we'll leave it there. Um, where this is where right on time, I can take one or two quick questions. Unfortunately, I, I have a, uh, one other quick thing I need to attend to before I've got a session um, in 15 minutes. But any quick questions, fine. Otherwise, you can message me. I'll be interacting tonight by the message system on Moodle, as long as it doesn't crash like yesterday. So thank you very much.